I'm Kathy Wotecki and I studied biology and chemistry here at Mary Washington. Because of that, I had a lot of opportunities uh, that opened a lot of doors for me. And through my career, I eventually became the Dean of Agriculture at Iowa State University and also the Chief Scientist and Undersecretary for Research and Education at the Department of Agriculture. Kathy's vision, leadership, and deep commitment to Mary Washington are evident in her service to our College of Arts and Sciences Advisory Board. She's been integral to the creation of our Beyond the Classroom Endowment, which supports the high-impact learning that is a hallmark of the Mary Washington experience. I'm pleased to announce that my husband Tom and I will be matching all gifts to the Beyond the Classroom Endowment from now until the end of July. Throughout the summer, UMW students will be conducting original research in this very building, exactly the kind of learning experience your donation to Beyond the Classroom Endowment will support. I hope you'll join us in creating this life-changing opportunity for students. Good afternoon. I'm Anand Rao, faculty member in communication and chair of the Department of Communication and Digital Studies here at the University of Mary Washington. Very pleased to welcome you back to IDIS 300, Life After COVID, offered by UMW. We're really excited about the presentation today. It's an important topic, and certainly not something that's unfortunately new, uh, but has been exacerbated by the pandemic over the last year and a half. And the presentation is titled, How Equal Are Women and Men? U.S. worker, working mother's vulnerability in a pandemic. We're very fortunate to have the presenter today who's an expert in this area. It's Dr. Kristen Marsh, who's professor of sociology and chair of our Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Now, I think that you'll, you'll remember how it was last week. The format for today is we'll have about a half an hour for the presentation, and then we'll have half an hour for Q&A. Uh, you have access to a chat box and a Q&A box. And as a reminder, the chat box is there really just to communicate with us panelists if there are any technical concerns. But if you have any questions for the presenter, and I know you will, and we've had really great discussions over the last two presentations, please put them in the Q&A box. Now, the function of the Q&A box is that not only are you able to post your questions, but you can also vote up your favorite questions. So make sure you're reading over the questions that are in the Q&A box, and then let us know that you'd like to see that question asked of our presenter by giving it the thumbs up and you vote it up, and the ones with more votes will be put at the top of the queue for the discussion. We've been able to get through quite a few in the last presentations, so hopefully we'll be able to get to your questions question this day as well. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Dr. Kristen Marsh, who has a, a wonderful presentation prepared for us. And after that, we'll be able to come back and join you for a Q&A. Dr. Marsh. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. And uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I appreciate being included in our Life After COVID course. It's such an important course as we're anticipating getting life somewhat back to normal um, and taking stock of where we've been, what we've experienced, and, um, and what we can do maybe better moving forward um, to make sure that our vulnerabilities are maybe shored up a little bit, both health-wise and as we'll talk about today in the labor market. Uh, I just, I, I do wanna take a, a quick moment to just welcome, I know we have some parents here, some of my colleagues are here, um, some uh, um, new students, some continuing students, community members. And so just thank you so much for um, supporting Mary Washington and, and coming out for this. Um, so my talk today, and I should get around to maybe sharing my screen here, apologies. Um, there we go. And 
if everyone can see that, let me know if not. Um, uh, uh, as I usually do, unfortunately, I played with the title after coming up with it in, initially. But um, yes, is the, the question is like, how equal really do women and men have it in the labor market, um, both leading up to the pandemic? And now what we, have we seen in the last year? And what can that tell us about some of our assumptions and normalized um, patterns? Uh, that we practice in the labor market. So testing gender equality, US working mothers vulnerability in a pandemic. Um, I have a lot of interests as a sociologist. One thing I love about working at Mary Washington is that um, you get to kind of go down slightly different paths um, as your, your interests shift and as our, um, as, I, you know, things come up in the world. And I returned um, shortly after coming to Mary Washington to a long standing interest in gender and work and particularly gender in the professions. Um, I've been a working mother. I am a working mother though my children are grown. I, um, but I, and I teach a course called uh, gender and work um, and and so that's that's my interest in it. A little bit about my status, so that you know, and my my um, my identity, um, so that we can understand that while I am a mother and, and I am a woman, um, an aging woman, um, I'm also privileged in my. Um, white and cisgender and highly educated status. So um, that is my. Um, not not so much bias, but that's my standpoint, and um, and that's the perspective that I understand better. But I hope that we'll be able to talk a little bit about how um, race and class, particularly, also impact mothers' experiences in the labor market. Um, let's see. So the central question um, in terms of vulnerability to the virus itself and in terms of the impact on our careers and livelihoods, the answer to the question, has COVID-19 been an equal opportunity offender, is absolutely not. I think early on in the pandemic, we thought, because we were all vulnerable in one way or another, but some communities, um, some age groups, uh, have shown to be much more vulnerable than others. And so there are three areas um, of concern that we've seen in the news and in our discussions over the last year and a half. First, who is the most vulnerable in terms of their health, of course? Uh, frontline essential workers, yes, but communities of color and the elderly have been most susceptible to the virus and to severe consequences and even death. So we know that COVID-19 was not an equal opportunity um, offender and we're not equally vulnerable, though we all have been vulnerable. Concerns have shifted here a bit to ensure that we encourage as many people to get the vaccine as possible and, and stay as safe as we possibly can. And continuing convincing those who hesitate is really has been a top priority in the news. And getting older kids vaccinated is certainly our next step. Um, I won't focus on that. We have other experts that, um, that uh, can tell us much more about the health impacts and, um, the, and the demographics of the pandemic. But the second is the question of the economy. Currently, we're hearing divisive debates around the stimulus package and around the effects of unemployment insurance, with some states even refusing, saying they're going to refuse um, unemployment be, um, because theoretically workers are turning down jobs because the unemployment is too good. I think the flip side of that coin is to, to say, well, um, maybe wages at the cafe aren't enough to make 
it by with a child at home during COVID. So um, the different ways of looking at that, certainly. Um, and I'm really more interested in which people have been the most vulnerable to job loss. And I'm interested to see how this will impact economic inequalities and career inequalities over the life course and following us into retirement, because that is what we we know that when a career gets interrupted um, for whatever reason, and the discussion has often been previously because of because of motherhood, um, because of other other care interruptions. Um, caring for um, uh, aging parents, for example, when a career is in, in, interrupted, not only is that does that get us off track in terms of our career, what we used to call it was the mommy track, right? That it's somehow a different track at work. That um, that we the that we also end up with um, less a fewer resources in retirement, less stability in our retirement. Um, it impacts our social security. Um, if we're lucky enough to have a pension, it impacts, it can impact our pension, um, um, any retirement benefits that we have. Um, so th this is my interest. How um, will this interruption uh, impact us moving forward? The issue, of work and the pandemic, unfortunately, is impossibly tangled with the question of caregiving. Who cares for young children when daycare is closed? Who supervises school-aged children when schools go online? Um, and who takes care of elderly parents unable to leave the house to run basic errands like grocery shopping? Um, my, my own parents live in North Carolina and uh, early in the pandemic, uh, when we were much more concerned about what well, we were as concerned about surfaces and um, touching our faces and um, uh, my my sister, my um, now retired sister, grocery shopped for my parents and um, and sprayed everything down with bleach before unpacking it and you know and made sure that they were not leaving the house. So um, there are these kinds of extra kinds of care that that um, everybody's got stories, right? That's that's just one. Um, and, and so that's connected to the third question and the third hot debate over the last year, which is the question of education. It's dominated our headlines. We heard so much about this, particularly in New York, uh, for example, and we saw multiple strategies across school districts as the challenges of keeping kids socializing and engaged ran up against the need to keep kids and teachers safe. And so that, you know, just the, the, the news every day was covered with um, sort of the going one strategy for a school district and then having to back out of that strategy. Do we need to keep kids in schools because the school, our school open because they're falling behind already and we have issues of, um, Wi-Fi connectivity, et cetera, um, uh, or do we keep kids safe? And, and it's been a real, a real challenge. And these two things are workplace experiences and our, and our challenges with education and caregiving really interact and Im impact one another um, and impact parents' lives. Um, so, um, so this is this is where I want to get to in my talk. Um, I, I'd like us to consider what the inequalities of job loss, career, and educational stagnation have looked like during the pandemic. I'm just it's a very I'm going to give you a very broad overview that's based more on what some of the readings I suggested um, give us than um, than really. I'm, I'm not going to throw a whole whole bunch of data at everybody, but I can I can certainly follow up with anybody who wants to on more specific questions. Um, and 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 so 
yeah, what have the inequalities of job loss, career and educational stagnation look like? What can this crisis tell us about pre-existing fissures um, in our normal system? And my basic claim is that parents, especially mothers and young women, are set up at canaries at, as canaries in the coal mine. Um, the labor market is already racist and sexist, um, which that part we may not be all be in agreement on. Um, but we are able because we are able to ignore that during what we consider to be normal times. Under this crisis, these contradictions are laid bare and have serious consequences. Um, and the clarity of vision that this crisis could give us can also be the source, I think, I hope, of good news and some strategies moving forward. So I'll end with some familiar policy and an ideological suggestions that could help us out whether or not we take advantage of those policy options um, is uh, certainly uh, a question. So basically two, set, two sets of questions. One, sort of a snapshot of what do we know so far? We don't know a lot. There's a lot we don't know yet because we need to see how things do pan out. But parents can tell us what their experiences have been, right? And we do have some recent data on um, the labor market and who's being impacted. Just not a lot of really thorough analysis of it yet. Um, and then secondly, and how does that follow? Why shouldn't we be surprised at this? How does this how is this really structured and predicated and could have been predicted by what we had already set up in the labor market? So with that first piece, some quick facts about COVID-19 in the labor market. Um, some of you may have read the policy brief from April 2021 by the Institute for Women's Policy Research, Out of Work, Taking on Care. It's one of the pieces that I offered um, for, uh, suggested for reading ahead. If so, you'll be familiar with their focus on the 16 to 24 age group, which was initially hardest hit by job loss, particularly young women and particularly young women of color. Um, so young women were more likely um, to experience job loss in the pandemic than other demographics. And young women cite care responsibilities as the main reason for not working. Um, and finally, female dominated industries have been the hardest hit by job loss in the, in the, in the pandemic. Um, so this graph is, a recreation and an extension of one of the reports graphs that's based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics data. I've extended the graph to include May 2021. And what's obvious here is that April 2020 was the month where the bottom fell out of the economy and, and in our jobs. Job loss among young women was 35% compared with just two months prior. Young men's employment was next hardest hit. Women 25 and over saw 15% decline and many men 25 and over saw 12% decline. So we definitely see a youth impact, a, a, a deleterious impact on youth, especially young women. And it's interesting to think about this age group. Um, the other thing we can say, see from this graph is that while the worst of the job loss was short lived, we still haven't quite fully recovered to pre pandemic employment levels among any group. Um, when I first saw this graph and the focus of that research report, I was a little skeptical at focusing on these this age group. After all, women in their 30s have been, and mothers in their 30s have been impacted as well. Women in their 40s, in their 50s, people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, parents in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. So um, the impact may be a little different and not show up 
as readily as job loss, but the impact is there. So I have friends who were trying to keep their research, who have been trying to keep their research programs going as conferences have been shut down, travel for research, we all know, um, was completely halted. So it hasn't been easy for anyone. So whether it's because you're in the low wage labor sector and are having trouble hanging on to jobs or because career advancement is difficult um, when there's caregiving or when there's other interruptions to our productivity, we're, we're all impacted in sort of different ways. Um, but I, I lost my skepticism a little bit because I think it matters for young women um, they are what the IWPR calls opportunity youth, and they're more likely to remain unemployed and stay out of school during a critical time of their development. So in the news, we've heard stories of high school students in rural Texas trying to take Zoom high school classes while at work. Actually, this has happened in college too, right? Um, they are trying to help the family because of parental job loss, or they're taking care of younger siblings because their parents are essential workers. They can't work from home, but they can't afford to pay for caregivers either. Um, and I had students in my classes tell me that they were taking care of younger siblings for exactly that reason, or they're taking care, they're caring for parents who are sick with chronic illness or having contracted COVID. So there's all kinds of care. It's not just young children, it's all kinds of caregiving that is, has been impacting um, women predominantly, um, though men as well, and, um, in, and also young women in particular. Um, so it's impacting us all, but it's impacted those with caregiving responsibilities the most and has impacted young women of color at higher rates than, than white women. Uh, and so here we see the percent of young women who are not enrolled in school or employed March to December 2019 and 2020. That's the comparison. And we can see that the 2020 data shows an increase for every group of young women. Um, that's that impact of you may not be working, but at least could you be in school, right? Are you, what do we call that human capital? Are you adding to your skills? Are you developing your skills? Are you building that, um, that, that record of work or are you um, getting your education? Um, and we could also talk about the cost of education um, and have the impact that that ha has had as well. But um, uh, yeah, and so this is again, um, IPWR data analysis, but it's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, finally, um, female dominated industries have been hardest hit by the pandemic. And this is a, a question of labor market um, segregation or segmentation that women and men tend to be in different industries and that the industries that women are tend to be in or tend to predominate in have been a hardest hit. So we are talking about education and health services, um, leisure and hospitality, retail and professional business services in comparison with that, that teal line is um, all other industries. And so we see that, um, for example, in education and health services, women 25 and up have ha experienced um, uh, actually women 16 to 24 have, have experienced uh, this, these, sorry, these are the industries that women tend to be employed in and they are the hardest hit industries. Um, I almost interpreted that completely wrong. 
Um, so it's that part of the labor market that you're in and whether that part of the labor market is going to allow you to keep working or require you to keep working on site um, under a pandemic. Um, so what else do we know about this? We know that only one in five workers have the option of working from home. Um, and that gets... Guess who is more likely to be able to work from home? Excuse me. I am, I am, right? Um, educated, higher income on average. Um, I'm sitting here on Zoom. I taught my classes on Zoom. I had stable employment all the way through, um, all the way through the pandemic. And, but, only one in five workers has that option. Black and Latino workers are less likely to be able to work from home. Essential workers are less likely to work from home. Um, also workers in hospitality. Um, the difference is that essential workers have to go to work, right? Um, and um, hospitality, like the restaurant industry, workers in, in these, um, segments were less likely to, were more likely to be laid off. Educated or, as I said, educated workers are more likely to be able to work from home and high wage workers are more likely to be able to work from home. That said, if you're a parent, father or mother, working from home is not easy if everybody's getting sent home. And so I don't mean to discount the difficulty of everybody, I mean, I just have an image of everybody sitting around the kitchen table, everybody on their own Zoom meeting um, <laughs> uh, or in different parts of the house, um, anybody's uh, access to the internet, stability of their Wi-Fi would be challenged by that. Um, and and it's it can be, it can be challenging um, and distracting at the, at the very least. So working from home isn't easy um, if you have uh, children or other caregiving responsibilities that are also home-based. Uh, so, so then how, if, if the pandemic has had this impact on parents, um, and I guess the only other thing I would want to say about that right away is that the question will be what's going to happen to those young women? What is going to happen to these um, uh, careers, even highly educated careers that are derailed because of the pandemic? What is the long term game there? And that's the question that if we if we have a post 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 um, pandemic um, course next summer, maybe we can look a little bit more than that at that, but it's it's gonna take a, a while for things to, um, to get back to whatever normal is. Um, but we shouldn't really be surprised. And I, I doubt anybody on this webinar is surprised. What we know um, about the pre-COVID-19 labor market it has to do with things like how many women are in the labor force, what are women, women's labor force participation rates, for example, what is the wage gap, what does segregation in the labor market look like, what is the motherhood penalty, is there really a motherhood penalty, is there really a fatherhood boost, um, and what is the dilemma of being a single parent. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna speed up because I see time is going faster than I realized. Um, and so this is, this is back to stuff that I normally talk about when I talk about gender and work. We know that women have always been in the labor for, force. It hasn't been since the 1970s um, women's movement um, that women worked. Women have always worked. But it is true that their, lab, their participation rates have increased and they have increased steadily, particularly lately among, uh, among married women 
and married women with children, it is less likely for new mothers to take time off from work in their or their careers in the early days of having a family. And I also say that there's there was a few years ago a big huzzah about the concept of um, women opting out of the labor market. And I just want to say that that has been, and this is in, I think there was a New York Times op-ed that I shared as well, that um, opting out is not what has happened. What happens is that because workplaces are so greedy, families are so greedy, um, and mothers are expected to be mothers and not workers, um, then, um, then women are more likely, even educated women, to get pushed out of the labor market rather than opting out because they, they, they will talk about it as if it's for the family. Um, Sarah Damaski shows that, that, they, that the justification is about the family, but they may have actually really loved their jobs and wanted to stay. It's just impossible um, because there's, there's so much conflict between the two. This graph just shows that over that same time period, the, where the highest increase in labor force participation rates has been among um, married women. Um, this is an interesting um, uh, study from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics that um, that I, I just so women are in 2018 women were 47% of the labor force at that time what you can see here is that that was projected to stay steady right and so um, that staying steady was a pre-pandemic uh, question and so um, it, it has been that it is the truth. It is true that the labor force participation rates were are not were not still growing even after even before the pandemic, and that's largely because of demographic differences. First of all, so many women who are in the labor market um, already are, um, but uh, also because we're an aging population. And so um, that, that demographic shift is enough to, um, to, to make a change. Older women are going to be less, more likely to go ahead and retire eventually, we, one would hope. Um, uh, in 2019, white women were paid 78% of white men's earnings. The gap overall is 18%. Um, often my students will say, but that's just for white women. Um, actually, that 18% is an overall. Um, but it is true that for Hispanic and Latina women, the gap it, between their um, what they are paid and what white men are paid is much larger, a 45% gap in pay um, and a smaller gap, but a gap nevertheless when compared with Latino men. Um, black women were paid 91% of black men's and 63% of white men's earnings. So we've got this pay gap. I, and I can say that when I entered, I entered graduate school a little bit late, later in life, I already had children, but, um, but you know, the gap was starting to close. And, uh, and at this rate, <laughs> You know, here I am 21 years later, and at the rate we're going, it will be, I think the predictions are 2098 or something before the gap can be closed. And that is if we don't have a huge interruption from um, the, pan the effects of the pandemic. Um, so where's this pay gap come from? There are two er areas. One is within job inequality. Okay, you know what? That's the part within jobs, especially if you're sitting next to somebody doing the same job, that's the part that's illegal. The part that's illegal is you have to have equal pay for equal work. It doesn't always mean that that happens. And the answer, the answer for employers is that, well, actually, Mates and janitors might be doing basically the same work, but they're not working in the same jobs. They're not side by side necessarily. And so um, we see already, even with very similar jobs, there is an inequality in pay. So 
hairdressers and barbers. I, you know, I'm, I'm hard pressed to argue that, that a barber is a lot more skilled than a hairdresser. Um, may, maybe somebody can convince me, but, um, but that's quite a pay gap. Um, so the, the other thing though, and I think the thing, the, the part that is a little bit harder for people to understand is still being about discrimination is the between job inequality. So we have sex segregation and racial segregation in the labor market. Um, women and men tend to work in different occupational settings. It may be that higher education, for example, is inclusive of women now, but we tend to be at different kinds of institutions. That's an example. So it's the workplace as well as the occupation. But it's also true that women are more likely to be in occupations that are considered um, care work. And we look at care as something that women do inherently naturally, that it's somehow hardwired. Um, and therefore, it's not a skill. And we know that, that um, social scientists will, will argue that that is actually not true, that anybody can be, I mean, beyond the fact that we, um, we nurture by breastfeeding babies, but other than that, um, men can work in care occupations and also care is, can be a highly skilled um, kind of job, whether it's in um, home health care, uh, whether it's teaching, there's a lot of care, um, kind of nurturing and empathy required in um, in teaching, so um, so it it's it, it's a question of whether we consider a type of job to be skilled, more skilled or less skilled, needing an education or not needing an education, learning on job training, etc. Um, the other thing about that is that um, jobs that are populated by women tend to be paid less because women are in them. And that is really backwards from the way we want to think about it. We want to think about the fact that we make choices that are based on what we are interested in, what we like to do. Um, but that gendering of jobs and then the gendering of the pay it's way more tangled than that simple um, story. Um, okay, so there is this, this motherhood penalty, um, right? So what, what, we, we, um, what we know is that once, actually gender inequality has declined um, but when once we look at motherhood as well as just gender, then we see that mothers are less likely to be hired. Pregnant women are less likely to be hired, even though both of those things are illegal. 41% um, of American households with children are headed by mothers. That Not that they're necessarily single mother households, but they're either the primary or the sole breadwinner. So it doesn't make any sense that mothers be considered the prime caregiver and fathers get be, are considered the primary breadwinner. But workplaces still adhere to that outdated, outdated ideal worker model where the hours are long, they're inflexible, and you're expected to have somebody stay at home taking care of everything else, right? Um, and so when women began demanding access to careers, um, the, the, the trade-off was um, was that we we didn't immediately demand that we also get help the same amount of help at home and and men and fathers do a lot more 
work in the home than they used to, but we're still holding on to the idea that it's the primary responsibility of mothers. And so when the pandemic hit, that's who it falls to, especially if women aren't getting paid equally in the labor market, then it makes sense. Like the micro economy of that is that I'm going to get together with my husband and I'm going to go, well, who's making more? Who's going to stay home if somebody has to stay home? Um, especially when childcare is so un unreasonably expensive relative to wages. Um, and it's just, you know, it just, it's untenable. So I'll, I'm just going to briefly wrap up here. We've got this story we like to believe that we are post-feminist, that women have as many opportunities to work and have careers. If they're earning less than men, it's a reflection on the abundance of choices and, and their choices in taking jobs that they want. But the reality is that Although women have formal educational and occupational opportunities, they still face all levels, uh, obstacles at all levels. They're pulled out from men dominated educational pathways. They're discriminated against in hiring. They do make some choices that are based on the realities of the of home life, but there's wage setting, there's promotional discrimination and personal challenges of juggling work and home obligations. So um, the American Association of University Women um, did a, a study and I, I didn't share that, but it's e easy to find on their, on their website. And I totally recommend that website. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, uh, that, that one year out of college, so with a BA degree, one year out of college, there's already a substantial wage gap between women and men, partly explained by the kinds of jobs that women and men go into after college, but even controlling for everything, there's still a 7% unexplained differential. So neither of those statements is completely myth or reality, but our popular ideas are that, um, that everything is fair. And that fairness idea aggrav aggravates the situation we, when we hit a pandemic. Um, okay, so what is the other way? Well, look, we could have paid leave. We have FMLA, which is um, the Family and Medical Leave Act and allows for, um, <laughs> allows for uh, workers to take time off for care, um, but it's not paid. Um, we could have more flexible workplace policies that don't assume a nine to five or nine to seven or eight to eight or whatever kind of hours um, a, a career might demand. Um, can we think about child care as a social responsibility instead of a personal private matter. Um, uh, can, we, can we pay a living wage? Um, can we set wages and occupations according to a measurable kind of skill instead of looking at who's, who's doing those jobs? I, and we can pass the pay, Paycheck Fairness Act um, finally, the myth busting care work is skilled work. Housework's not women's work. And um, we all have family obligations. And if we could just balance family and work a little bit better, then maybe um, the next crisis won't hit us in exactly this, that way. Thanks. Hi, Dr. Marsh. Thank you so much. Keith Mellinger here, Dean of Arts and Sciences at Mary Washington. Uh, a fabulous presentation. Um, I love the data. It, it, it's really fascinating. And the way you ended is exactly the way the Q&A is going to start, because uh, we, you know, you really uh, generated an awful lot of, uh, of questions here today, because there's, there's a lot to talk about here. But um, our first question that, that has a lot of votes is from one of our alums class of 2004, Alex. Hi, Alex. Welcome to the class. Uh, you know, you talked about child care and care in general, and arguably it's a foundational part of the workforce. It, it's the kind of job that allows other jobs to happen in, in some ways, but it's certainly uh, perceived maybe sometimes as undervalued, undercompensated. 
Uh, how do we how do we change that perception? And you, you actually touched on this at the very end about policy, but um, is there anything you want to maybe add about how we can change that perception? Yeah, um, sure. I think that that that's it's a really good question because it hits at a cut. There's a tension there, isn't there? There's a tension between being able to afford care and which I don't want to pay more for 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 my parents elder care right uh, and being able to make a living if you're doing care work and uh, and and i think it's a matter of reevaluating what we care about <laughs> looking at our values and saying this is actually worth the money let's pay our home health care workers a living wage and and, and also, you know, put in place some institutional workplace policies that, you know, that trust home health care workers a bit more. Um, it, there, there's, I, I can't think of the name of the, the author now, but there's been this is a, quite a bit of research on care work and the, how that interface between those being taken care of and those um doing the care what that relationship ends up looking like right and so same with infant care same with preschool um same actually how often do i have future educators in my classes and and everyone will say, well, I'm not going into it for the money. Well, I'm good because um, it, it's going to burn you out and it's not going to pay that well. And you're doing the most important work ever. So um, that's not an answer, is it? We, I, it's, it's, yeah. it's a commitment. It's a cultural commitment that, that uh, you know, I don't know where I fall on. Do we implement policy? and rules that therefore gradually shift our perception of things, or is it the other way around? I think you kind of need to go at it from both. Yeah, well, one thing you're touching on, which I have said for, for the last year, is that a lot of these problems already existed. Yeah. It's just that the pandemic has amplified them. Absolutely. Brought them to, to the surface more than, than yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. difficult. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. That's why this concept of op opting out, which is like in the early 2000s, I think, it was mm -hmm. like, n no, um, women are leaving the labor market because they can't do both well and, um, and they can't pay. Um, and there's just not, there's not enough flexibility between the two. Um, so, yeah. I have the next question, and this has to do with low wage workers, people of color, mm -hmm. um, and women with care caregiving responsibilities. And and the um, the question, the person um, who's posed this question wants to know that did younger people have a harder time than older in these situations? Thinking especially about these groups. Um, in other words, were they more or less? affected or the same, um, I'm, I'm assuming with the pandemic. Yeah, um, so the, the, the data that we looked at, that graph, and, and actually it's, it's <laughs> no, nobody's gonna wanna hear this, but it's so fun to go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and play around with their data because you can, you can check all those like demographics and figure it out. It just happens to be that in that report, they focused on the 16 to 24 age group. I was a little surprised at that, as I mentioned initially, um, but if you compare that age group with the, um, um, Oh no, I love the BLS 16 Queen Law. <laughs> That's my point. It is, it was super fun to play with it. Um, but the, 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 24 and above age group in the report they um uh they 
they call that the the uh, primary age work, work working age or something and um and it, it just felt broad to me so but generally that younger age group is was harder hit initially absolutely however you know, 30 year olds have children and, and are in the labor market. It's a different kind of impact, I think. It's not necessarily, am I getting laid off because my restaurant is closing? Um, it's more, what are the challenges of my advancement? I feel like I missed part of the question. Was there a, a race part of this question? Uh, yeah, that was kind of, it was kind of all of those groups. So yeah. low income, race, and yeah. then, uh, women in the younger age yes. groups. Yes, um, young Hispanic and black women are the hardest hit for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, particularly if they're mothers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I have the, the next question, Dr. Marsh, and it's uh, from another alum. Thanks, Kara, for, for the question. And it's tied to an issue that really wasn't the, the center of your presentation, but is another one of the issues that unfortunately is not new, but was certainly exacerbated by the pandemic. And it has to do with the alarming increasing rates of intimate partner violence during COVID, during the pandemic. Is this something that, that maybe you could speak to? What's going on here? I should be able to. And I'll have... Uh, I'll just do it with a heavy caveat because I, I am not positive, but my gut feeling is that look at how, how isolated we are. And, um, and if we're isolated, then those stressors just add to, to whatever pre-existing stressors we're facing and and where's this? Where's the safety valve, right? And so that's that's not a very specific response, but and maybe Kara Kara has something um, in mind. I bet um, she's been paying attention to this, but um, yeah, I I think it's another just another another vulnerability that our isolation is really. I mean, mental health too um, is is really our mental health has been challenged um, by this. So that's not an adequate answer, but I complicated question though too. It's a great really question. Is, yeah. So uh, to shift gears just a little bit, do, are you aware of any studies on uh, sort of level of employment? Um, people working two and three jobs in the past after the pandemic, are they not working two and three jobs like they were? Um, is that one of the reasons we're seeing so much unemployment or, or uh, so many businesses hiring? I mean, you can't, as, as, as Dan Wolf said in our first presentation, you can't walk down any main street without seeing help wanted signs everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, are these somehow connected? Are people not working the two and three jobs like they used to? Um, so they, gosh, I hope not. <laughs> but, that, um, but yeah, we're not out of it yet, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, no, I, I, I feel like I'm gonna have to say, I'm not sure again, uh, um, but I, 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 and I think that that, it's true that employers are, there's a mismatch between what employers are looking for and who's ready to go back to work. And what I think about when I, I think about that question of, you know, we're not gonna accept unemployment because it's keeping people from going back to work. Like, well, if you're a young mother at home, 
when schools still closed and you know we haven't quite resurfaced from it how are you going to take that job so that unemployment may be your lifeline um and and I, I, yeah so i i my my hypothesis my guess um is that no but they will be right that they may not be yet but they will be again unless we do something serious with our um, minimum wage uh, that segues really well into our, our into our next question which has to do with um uh, kind of comparing our uh, situation in the United States with other developed countries, um, for example, Northern European countries um, that already have established uh, government funded social welfare systems that value their policies, value the role of women in society. Are you aware of how um, they, these countries have fared during the pandemic? If if those um, systems have served them or if women were still adversely impacted um, during COVID? These questions are too good. <laughs> um, uh, um, no, um, I, am, I am not aware, um, but I'm definitely gonna go look. Um, it's, I, it's been hard for me to follow what is going on with the pandemic generally it, throughout Europe. It seems to be such a mixed bag and in terms of the health crisis itself. Um, with Didn't London just shut down again? And um, so I, I would imagine that that um, family friendly approach. I mean, that's what I'm sort of positing um, is that it would help, right? Um, but that, but I don't, that's, a, that's such a, a, an appropriate question. If I'm claiming that, I need to be able to point to um, the social democratic countries that are more supportive of families generally. I don't see how it couldn't help, but help, but help. The next question really points to a number of things that you were you were discussing within the presentation. But you know, from an outside perspective, uh, it appeared that during the pandemic, that women at all levels were adversely affected through caregiving responsibilities in a way that we haven't really seen in past crises. If we think of other financial crises, for instance, of you know maybe in two thousand eight. Um, there were certainly a number of, of mothers and women that were adversely affected, but it didn't seem to hit all strata in the way that the pandemic did. Is this unusual? Um, do you think that maybe that's just the initial read that we all saw in the first few months and then now it's a little different as we've gone through over the last year? No, I think that that makes a lot of sense because of the impact on our school. We shut down. Um, and, and in the recession, we absolutely shut down but our schools didn't shut down, right? Um, and, um, and whole families were affected in the 2000s. You know, people were losing their homes. Um, and there was job loss, but I am not aware of that job loss affecting women more than men. Um, uh, and unemployment was extended, but it wasn't nearly as, uh, um, and there wasn't the kind of stimulus the, and the kind of a, approach to um, normal people in terms of our and Main Street, uh, um, in terms of our response to that economic crisis. Um, but I think there's a lot we did wrong in the aftermath of the, the mortgage lending crisis and the the Great Recession uh, that we could have, you know, we could have implemented some different policies. But no, I think that's a real difference between the pandemic and the recession. Mm -hmm. um, we, we need to wrap up here in just a minute, but maybe as a 
final parting thought, are, are there any strategies that you're hearing about that employers are implementing to try to address some of these issues yeah, that you've, you've yeah. you know, shed you know, light on? Uh-huh. You know, it's interesting because it's actually quite common for workplaces to have, even before the pandemic, because look, look at what we've learned about what we can do from home, right? We've learned, wow, I can actually do so much. I don't want to go to the office right now, right? I, you know, like on my window in my backyard. And um, we've, so what I'm hoping is that the, we'll have a culture shift that where workers aren't presumed to be less dedicated just because they want more flexibility in the way they do their work. And even, and for there's longstanding a number of employers, corporations tend to have flexible workplace policies, not across the board, but where companies have um, either flexible hours or telecommuting options, people don't take advantage of them because they're not, they have them in place, they'll let you do it, but there are biases. There, there's a flexibility bias. If somebody does take advantage of those policies, they're looked at by their coworkers and by their immediate supervisors as not caring as much about the job. And, um, and that I think we have a possibility of actually seeing a shift that won't be that hard one that it won't be hard because everybody wants to have more flexible policies now if we don't tie it just to motherhood and parenthood then it could you know it could have a real impact and and you know same on space I don't know I don't know what that's going to mean in terms of the way workplaces like divvy up their offices and their work spaces. Yeah, it's a lot to consider moving forward. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Dr. Kristen Marsh. Really appreciate you being a part of the course. Uh, there's a lot here. And um, you've generated, you know, 30 questions in the Q&A box here. So I think uh, students, uh, let's take them into our small group discussions and continue the conversation. I think there's a lot to and talk about here. If anybody wants to continue with me, kmarsh at umw.edu. I should have put that on my first slide, but um, you know, contact me and we can, we can keep the convo going. Well, thank you so much. And for, for everybody else, uh, please join us on Thursday. Uh, our speaker on Thursday is Dr. Jeffrey McClurkin. Um, he is a professor in the Department of History and American Studies, but he's also uh, the, the chief of staff for the university and he's part of a statewide group uh, that was working on the the the, go, the COVID pandemic and how higher ed responds to it. And so he's going to share with us uh, his talk on the university after COVID. So uh, join us on Thursday at four o'clock for that talk. Uh, students, we'll look forward to seeing you in the small group discussions uh, in just, uh, just the next minute or so. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.